8. How Charius, suspecting that Calerho had been handed over to Dionysius, determined to avenge himself on the king and so went over to the Egyptian side. How he was appointed admiral and gained control over the sea. How after his victory he seized Aratus, where the king had placed his own wife for security, along with all his train and Calerho too. All of that has been described in the previous book, but fortune was minded to do something as cruel as it was paradoxical. Charius was to have Calerho in his possession and fail to recognize her, while taking others' wives on board his ships to carry them off. He was to leave his own behind, not like Ariadne, asleep. And not for Dionysus to be her bridegroom, but as spoils of war for his own enemies. But Aphrodite thought this too harsh. She was growing less angry with him. At first she had been incensed by his misplaced jealousy. She had given him the fairest of gifts, fairer even than the gift she had accorded to Alexander Paris. And he had repaid her kindness with arrogance. But now that Charius had made honorable amends to love, in that he had wandered the world from west to east and gone through untold suffering, Aphrodite took pity on him. Having harassed by land and sea the handsome couple she had originally brought together, she decided now to reunite them. And I think that this last chapter will prove very agreeable to its readers. It cleanses away the grim events of the earlier ones. There will be no more pirates, or slavery, or lawsuits, or fighting, or suicide, or war, or conquest. Now there will be lawful love and sanctioned marriage. So I shall tell you how the goddess brought the truth to light and revealed the unrecognized pair to each other. It was evening, and much of the captured material was still left on shore. Worn out as he was, Charius got up to make his arrangements for the ship's departure. As he was passing through the town square, the Egyptian said to him, Sir, there is the woman who wouldn't come up to you but wants to kill herself. Perhaps you can persuade her to get up. Why leave behind the choices of the spoils? Polycharmus added his weight to the suggestion. He wanted to push Charius into a new love affair, if at all possible, to console him for the loss of Calderho. Let's go in to her, Charius, he said. So he went in the door. When he saw her stretched out on the ground with her head covered, he felt his heart stirred at once by the way she breathed and the look of her, and felt a thrill of excitement. He would certainly have recognized her had he not been thoroughly convinced that Dionysius had taken Calerho for himself. He went up to her quickly. Don't be frightened, lady, he said. Whoever you are, we are not going to force use force on you. You shall have the husband you want. Before he had finished speaking, Calerho recognized his voice and threw the covering from her face. They both cried out at the same time, Charius, Calerho! And they fell into each other's arms, swooned, and fell to the ground. At first, Polycharmus, too, could only stand there struck speechless by this miracle. But after a time, he said, Get up. You have recovered each other. The gods have granted your wishes, both of you. But remember that you are not in your own country, you are in enemy territory, and the first thing to do is deal with that situation so that no one separates you again. He had to shout. They were like people plunged deep in a well who could scarcely hear a voice calling from above. Slowly they came to themselves. Then, when they saw each other and embraced, they were overcome again. And this happened a second time and a third time. All they could say was, you are in my arms. If you really are Calerho, if you really are Charius. The rumor spread that the admiral had found his wife. Now a soldier stayed in his tent, not a sailor on his ship, not a lodgekeeper at his door. 
people poured together from all sides, saying to each other, What a lucky woman to win such a handsome husband! But when Kalarho appeared, no one praised Charius anymore. They all turned their gaze on her, as if she alone existed. She moved with dignity, escorted on either side by Charius and Polycarmus, and they had flowers and wreaths showered on them. Wine and myrrh were poured out at their feet as they walked. The sweetest fruits of war and peace were joined in celebration of victory and marriage. Charius was in the habit of sleeping on board ship, since he was busy night and day. Now, however, he handed everything over to Polycharmus and went into the royal bedroom without even waiting for night to fall. In every town, there is a special house set aside for the great king. In it was a bed of beaten gold covered with a cloth of Tyrian purple of Babylonian weave. Who could describe that night? They told each other countless adventures. They wept endlessly. They embraced endlessly. It was Kalarho who began with her story, how she had come back to life in the tomb, how she had been carried off by Theron how she had crossed the sea, how she had been sold. Up to that point, Charius had wept as he listened, but when he reached Miletus in her account of her adventures, Charius became embarrassed and fell silent, and Charius's natural jealousy rose up in him again. He was consoled, however, when he heard about the child. But before he had heard the whole story, he said, Tell me how you came to Aratus, and where you left Dionysius, and what you have had to do with the king. She said at once, she swore that she had not seen Dionysius since the trial. The king, she said, was in love with her, but she had no contact with him, not even a kiss. Then I have been unjust and quick-tempered in doing the king so much damage when he was not harming you. When I was separated from you, I thought I had to go over to his enemy's side, but I have not disgraced you. I have filled land and sea with trophies of victory. And he told his whole story in detail, taking pride in his successes. But when they had had enough of weeping and describing their adventures, they fell into each other's arms and gladly turned to the pact of their bed as of old. 